In this special episode of Mind Pump, so we answer questions asked by listeners like you. You go to our Instagram page, Mind Pump Media. Uh, you uh, ask us a question underneath the Qua meme. We pick the best ones, and then we answer them. And in the beginning of the episode, we do our introductory conversation where we talk about current events. We had a the, hidden guest on this the one. The news, uh, and, yeah, and we have a lot of fun. And today's episode has special guest. Uh, Christina from the wellness, excuse me, realness wellness yeah, don't, podcast. Don't wellness realness. Yeah, it, okay? Realness wellness yeah. podcast. That's not right. So, <laughs> so we started by talking about uh, my wedding. Apparently, I'm getting married, and they found out through email. Sorry, fellas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talked about a, for that. a new DNA dating app. Apparently, people are meeting up with each other based on their genetics. That's kind of weird. We talked about uh, Skinny Dip. This is our last commercial with Skinny Dip. Justin is totally distraught. I'm going to go cry later. Because he can't eat chocolate almonds all day anymore. Uh, then we talked about the three rules to escaping poverty. Read an article. If you do those three things, you're very likely to uh, escape poverty. I talked about how Italians are the world's healthiest people. We talked a little bit about Pat politics. Back. The impeachment process. So what's going on right now? The Democratic candidates and China... Uh, we talked about the feathered dinosaur tail that was found and uh, our five-year, upcoming five-year anniversary party at Organifi headquarters. And of course, Organifi, the makers of organic supplements and vegan protein powders. They are one of our favorite sponsors and partners. If you go to Organifi.com forward slash Mind Pump and use the code Mind Pump, you'll get 20% off. Now, Skinny Dipped still is one of our sponsors, uh, and we have a discount for you. If you go to skinnydipped.com forward slash mind pump and enter the code mind pump, you'll get a massive 20% off. Then we got into the fitness questions. The first question was, why is it so easy for some people to build muscle? Is it genetics? So we talk all about the factors that can uh, play into somebody being able to build muscle easily versus others who might maybe look like it's a, it's a tough thing for them. Is it just genetics or are there other things? Next question, uh, why does strength training require more rest than hypertrophy, a.k.a. muscle building type training? So why do you have to rest longer between sets when you're trying to train for maximal strength? The next question, is there ever a need to go above 12 reps with your workouts or are you wasting your time? And the, the last question, what are some strategies to avoid burnout as a personal trainer? Also, this month, all month long, MAPS Aesthetic is 50% off. Now, MAPS Aesthetic is a full workout program complete with workout videos, demos, blueprints. It's designed for people who are mainly focused on changing the appearance of their body, their aesthetics. It helps you sculpt and shape your body as you see fit. You literally pick certain exercises based off of your weak body parts, plug them into the program, follow it, and like a sculptor, shape your perfect body. So it's 50% off. Here's how you get the discount. Go to mapsblack.com and use the code BLACK50, B-L-A-C-K-5-0, no space, for the discount. This, Mate, yeah. Is she a heavy breather, though? <laughs> no, no. You're the only... <laughs> yeah. No, she breathes through her nose. Yeah. She's fine. The heavier I get, the more I start to breathe like no, you, I'm though. A mouth breather. Did you know that? Right. It's because you're building a lot of muscle. It's something. Whoa. Something's heavy. Yeah. I was. Yeah. I was <laughs> last this morning. Jessica wakes up and she goes. This is, she goes. This is how you breathe. <laughs> <laughs> like you're shushing people. Yeah. She's like, what are you, <laughs> she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> oh man, <sighs> I'm getting too heavy. <sighs> Dude, the 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 vibrating sound coming from the back that was in the back there with the construction reminds me of the the time. Did I ever tell you guys about the time the we had someone working on the house and uh, they you heard one of our stuck? They, no, they heard oh. one of our vibrators. Yeah. I hear, did I tell you about this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This. This is a, yeah With true. the foam roll? Yeah. True story. Yeah. No, 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 no. no, 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 no upstairs, no. it was it kicked on, and they could hear it vibrating. He thought he told the story twice. Did I? Yeah. It, that's not how it went, though. No, no. Story. It was. I, I, you tell the story where I remember it. You could hear this. Yeah. Up, upstairs. No, we had a guy. We had a guy going under the house. That's what it was. And he was doing oh. work for us under the house. Uh huh. And he comes back inside, and he goes, "I hear a, a <laughs> weird sound. I can't figure out what it's coming from." So I go underneath the house with him and I'm listening. It's like, what is that? What the <laughs> fuck is that? Yeah. Couldn't figure it out. Couldn't. Finally, I'm like, what's directly above me? Oh, shit. Closet. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> it was yes. on the floor. <laughs> just left from the and night then, before. And, and then I went, yeah, I went, I went back down. He's like, it just turned off. I'm like, weird. Yeah. Oh, that's weird. It just turned <laughs> totally off. Totally weird. Yeah. That's it. How did it turn on? Uh, I have no idea. 
Hey, you're not allowed to talk. Yeah, what are you doing? You just sit there. Yeah, I, I can talk. No, you no, no. Can't your talk. job is to read the questions, <laughs> yeah. ruining you're, you're everything. I'll cue you when you're allowed to talk. <laughs> oh man, goodness gracious! Anyway. Just, just sit there and look pretty, little girl. Yeah. What you do? What you do in there? Yeah. Hey, so I open up uh, my base camp uh, two days ago. Oh, and God. I'm, talk about I'm looking at yes. I'm looking at trips uh, that I want to plan because we're you know looking ahead and trying to make sure everything's you know in order. Yeah, and so you got to do that. And, yeah. and Katrina goes, uh, Sal's getting married in February. Surprise! And yeah. I was like, what? Da, 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 da. <laughs> instantly, Base camp told you. Yes, instantly text the group thread, <laughs> and Sal is like, <laughs> Yeah, guys, I fucking I'm getting married in February. Like literally, we found out through yeah. Base Camp. Yeah. yeah. Don't yeah. worry. Yeah, it's not. You were the worst friend <laughs> not ever. A big no, deal. Worst no, friend ever. You have to understand what happened. I when I know I'm gonna do something, I have to put it in Base Camp before I forget. <laughs> So, so the same before you forget to tell your friends. No, no, no. Before uh, I listen, not before I forget to, to to mark off those dates because I've done this in the past to Katrina and every other assistant that's ever worked with me or whatever. I'm terrible with memory. This stuff. gives me so little time to plan the bachelor party. Hmm? Yeah, we're gonna do a bachelor. It's party? gonna be crazy now. We well, have to. I'm yeah, 40. I'm forty. I mean, we're gonna get the last minute. What, kind of, bachelor, what kind of a bachelor party? You're is gonna have to push. The, you're gonna have to push this date out, man. We need to have a party. <laughs> yeah. What, what are yeah. we gonna do? Uh, we'll do something. We'll Watch a movie. Yeah. We're not going to air it. I'll tell you that much. Go golfing. Yeah. Yeah. No, the, the day that I put it in base camp, that's that day. That's the same day that we decided on the date that we were going to go up to City Hall and, and do the whole thing. So I was literally going to tell you guys the next day on when the I came way to work. <laughs> yeah, no. Oh, by Except the way. Except that you tagged us all in the email, you know, of responding. Dude, you know me, yeah, dude. I'm, ter I'm terrible fine. with remembering yeah. kind of all that worst, shit. Worst no, I saw ever. that and I texted you. I was like, what the hell is this, bro? And I'm like, oh yeah, they can yeah. see this. Yeah. I forgot. <laughs> no, we, we were, we were, we've been, you know, on and off kind of talking about it uh, here and there. And um, it, we also have been talking about in the past, like, you know, maybe having a, a child and trying for a baby and all that stuff. And, you know, I had a lot of fears uh, over commitment and over having another child left over from, you know, getting divorced. I was married for 15 years. I have two kids. It's a very difficult process. And when you leave a situation like that, I'm sure people listening who've, who've been divorced can maybe relate. It uh, it leaves you, uh, it can leave you fearful. But here I am. I'm with a woman who's phenomenal, excellent, you know, acts like a stepmom to my kids, even though she's not married to me. We have a great relationship. She puts up with my all my insecurities and fears around that kind of stuff. And I finally got to the point where, okay, I think this is, I'm, I'm, I'm ready. And, uh, you know, I, we started talking about it. And the problem is, is that if we were going to start trying to get pregnant, there was a certain window to do so because she wants her mom to be here for it. And then that means that if we were going to get married, it would either have to happen after potentially having a child or right before or right around the same time. And I wanted my kids to see us married first and all that stuff. So it just was like, boom, boom, boom. So all the fear gone. Yeah. It, it was a long process. But when it finally left, it was like, uh, man, everything just opened up. It, it, it was there. It was lingering. And that's the thing about fear is it's doubt. And if it stays, if the doubt is there, um, it, could, uh, it, it can poison you a little bit. Um, but I was also very careful. In the past, I'd mentioned these things to her. And... I kind of waver back and forth, which wasn't very fair. So a while ago I made it, I said, I'm not going to talk about this anymore unless I'm totally ready to do this and through that whole process about working on things and, and stuff. So that's it, man. Yeah, so surprise. No, well, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like I feel so like like you took the wind out from me. I was gonna, I was I was gonna write about, it, yeah. write it back an email like that. Yeah. Congrats yeah, yeah. an email. Hey, hey, congrats. <laughs> yeah. uh, Are you guys yeah. really mad? I didn't tell yeah, you guys yeah, before like, I wrote no, it down. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Yeah. I, I gonna you, we got to give you shit about it though. I mean, that's like, uh, come on, that's your job. Yeah, dude. yeah, yeah like, that just it accelerated fast. That went from like thinking about it to like happening like really quick. Well, it was again. It was when it's in base camp. It's real. Honestly, the goal was. I was going to surprise her. We were going to go on a trip in February and I was going to surprise her there. Um, but then the window of, you know, when we're going to try having a baby and all that stuff, like it had to happen a little sooner. So anyway, I talked to the kids too. We told the kids about it. Yeah. What they, what they think? The best uh, response you could ever imagine. Awesome. Absolutely incredible. Like I, we, we told the kids and you, I don't, you never know what, you know, what, what, what kids are going to say. Well, you have, you have two amazing right. kids, which brings me to another point. Do you know anybody that has four amazing kids? My parents. <laughs> My parents have four of me. Justin uh, and I were trying to figure out the other day. Yeah, because I, I have zero, uh, uh, you know. 
I, I don't know anybody. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Is there, there's, always, there's always one. Yeah. There's there's always, the, the odds there, get There's the one the that, that, that killed my kids' uh, goldfish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they had four kids. Yeah. No, and then there's right. another one. They, they, I have many examples yeah. of. You I know, mean, you hit it out the park with the but, first two. That's a lot to live up to for yeah, these two. Yeah. The other two are going to see like these kids that went to private schools, 4.0 GPA, yeah. fucking yeah. well. Odds start getting, you know, a little bit uh, out of your favor. Yeah. Let's just say. No, I, I, when we told the kids, I didn't know what to expect. I thought maybe there'd be. My, my maybe my daughter would be a little jealous because she's the youngest or you know are they going to worry about dad spending more time because you know my kids are it's it's dual custody with my ex-wife right so they're with us half the time but if I have a child with Jessica obviously they're going to be with me all the time mm-hmm. so I thought oh you know I wonder what the, there's a lot of potential you know issues and questions right but no my kids right out the gates I told my son picked him up from school we're driving home and I'm like hey um you know I just want to let you know that Jessica and I are are going to get married. And my son, he lives in a three to five range. Well, at least you didn't email him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I sent him a text. He lives in a three to five range. You know? And he's a typical 14-year-old boy, teenager, where he doesn't go below a three, never goes above a five. Everything's kind of like, eh. you know what I mean? That's his, that's his yeah. answer to everything. Yeah. So I told him and he smiled, which was a good sign. Yeah. And he goes, oh, that's cool. He goes, I already told my friends that she's my stepmom anyway. So I'm like, oh, that's cute. That's sweet. Because <laughs> she's a hot stepmom. Yeah. That's why. That's, <laughs> bro, for sure, dude, he's a high school kid. That's, you've got the fucking come, hot. Come, come over and see. Yeah, yeah, come check out my stepmom. <laughs> she totally make cookies. I, yeah, 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 yeah. I blame Pornhub for all that stupid uh, shit. Every other video on there. Then yeah, then true. my my uh, my daughter, she was so excited. Her questions were, can I help decorate the baby's room? Can I help you pick out a dress? You, you, know, you guys don't need, are not supposed to see each other the day of the wedding. Super excited, super. And they since we've told them, they're like so happy. It's so and it makes perfect sense when two kids see a two a, a couple that they consider as parental figures. Me for sure as a biological father, and Jessica who's, who's lived with them now for you know almost four years. It makes sense that they see this. It's, it's natural, you know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like oh, they love us both. We love them. We're gonna get. Why wouldn't they be? You know, happy and excited. So it's kind of exciting. Told my parents they were, of course, my mom was ridiculous. Oh, yeah. Here's my mom. Well, you come from big family. So that's oh, like yeah. more kids is more, more than married. More, yeah, exactly. Dude, more he, oh, dude, this is my mom. So, I'm, you know, we tell my mom and, and, you know, I'm like, and, you know, we're probably, we're going to, you know, try having a baby. And they're all excited. My mom's like, I see at least two or three kids. That's what I see in the future for you. Like, mom, calm down. <laughs> My God, relax, you know. Now, does does her or you, do you, either one of you have any like cynical family members who are just like, oh, you guys shouldn't do that? Or, or is everybody My pro? family is so family oriented yeah. and so pro. And hers too. You know, when we do family function, so so maybe four, might have been a month ago. Like none of her family is worried about you you dying too early because how much older you are. <laughs> yeah, you know, that, it's, it's, that much older, geez. <laughs> <laughs> I'm fit and healthy. <laughs> Damn it. Silver going into a new one. Yeah. 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 Like, yeah. you sure, Jessica? You yeah. know, he's got quite a few years on you and stuff like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, everybody's he's using his juve light. Everything's every, fine. Everybody's super supportive. Uh, my, fa- It's funny, four weeks ago, four to five weeks ago, we were uh, up at, we visited my sister up in San Mateo and we were uh, watching her youngest son um, this little I told you guys about him he's a little turkey anyway we're having a f- good time later on in the day my parents come to visit and my dad sees she, he sees Jessica at family parties and if we're at a family party and there's a baby or a kid Jessica is going to be with the kid it's just her favorite thing right so my dad's you know watching her and he's you know and he looks at me pulls me aside starts speaking Italian so she doesn't understand and he goes uh, so do you, you, you think you're going to have a kid with her or something and I'm like why and he goes She's a hundred percent for sure. That's look at her. She needs to have a baby. He's looking at me and I'm like, yeah, I think I'm going to, this is, this is about five weeks ago. I didn't tell anybody. I just told my dad. So he was, he knew, you know what I mean? Now everybody knows now, right? The whole family knows. We told everybody. Okay. Yeah. Everybody's, everybody knows we about the whole thing. Last said, know, yeah. You didn't know. No. Yeah. You guys were actually, uh, Third? uh yeah. yeah. Okay. No, so now you got to go the awkward phase of saying we're trying oh, to everybody. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We're trying, we're trying. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, whatever, you know, God willing or whatever, it's uh, we'll try. And if it works out the way, you know, the timing or all, it's perfect. No. If not, we'll be happy. It's a lot of fun practicing. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. I love practice. um, Yeah. Practice makes perfect. Yeah. I think it it was a year and a half. It took Katrina and I. That was a long time. Well, you guys took a while because you didn't know that she had the The cyst. Yeah. Yeah. As soon as that got taken care of. I mean, that's what we assume, right? Because it seemed like right after that happened that uh, she got pregnant right Mm -hmm, away. mm -hmm. Although there is some speculation that it happened before because it was so so quick. Oh, Uh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, and he was 
four weeks early too. So some of that, some of that speculation is, oh, was he four weeks early, or did it actually happen? Did mm. she get pregnant a little bit earlier? Dude, in my family right now, you have uh, my. I have two cousins. Uh, my ex brother in law, who's like a brother to me, I grew up with him, and even maybe my brother are all probably going to get hitched and start trying within the next year or two. Also. So this could potentially be like an explosion mm, of Steph knows are taking over. <laughs> start a little army or whatever, down the hatches of, yeah. uh, of children. Hey, speaking of relationships, did you see the the new DNA uh, dating app? No, what? Oh, uh, I did yeah, see that. It's called Digi D eight. So uh, Did Digidate. Yeah. yeah, like Digidate, you know? <laughs> And, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Digidate. Digidate. It's yeah. D D I G I and then D and then the number, number eight. eight. Yeah. Digidate. Digidate? Yeah. The yeah. eight is just eight. Yeah. What did I say? Digidate. Digidate. Oh. Digidate. Yeah. What are you That's gonna do? Fine. So anyway, what is Anyways, it yeah. It's like a DNA based. So they they try and match people to like so potentially they don't have any kinds of issues like genetically with the with what they pass on like potentially if there's a problem you know trait so they don't even like present people that might have like carry a certain uh you know like problematic disease that would pair with them so oh wow but i don't know that the science is is shaky with it well i heard they get so the article i read was talking about how they got a lot of flack for that because like they, eugenics yes yeah. <laughs> So, so like, that yeah. he got a lot of pushback from the from people saying like oh we're trying to yeah because there are lots of situations purify everybody or where you where you'll have a recessive gene for a genetic disorder and it's not a problem unless you get with someone who has the same gene in which case then all of a sudden you see a genetic right you know uh, genetic issue pop up like I, I have a friend who has a gene a recessive gene I think for uh, I think it's Lou Gehrig's disease mm. and it's totally fine. As long as he doesn't get with somebody who has the same gene, otherwise, no, there's no chance. Totally yeah. fine. Now, which, they, which I can see an argument for that. Anyway, I was going to ask you guys, what yeah. are you, what are your thoughts on that? Are you? Pro? I I feel like if you have that gene, you probably already know because this day and age, you would have lost so many. Because the way that people typically find out these days is. Oh my God! Four of my aunts and two of my uncles died of the same thing. Mm -hmm. Then the family gets tested and they find that they have this uh, this gene. And then, you know, I guess you would tell the person you're dating, "Hey, we have this gene or whatever." Mm -hmm. I don't know. This is kind of interesting. The science isn't so great though. How are they going to? Besides the the ones we know, what are they going to do? They're going to tell you that you match up great with this person genetically. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's it's really just kind of screening out if there was like a potential for a recessive gene like match like that where, you know, like, oh, we do have this potential disease. Let's let's just like keep it within like this group over here. That's very, very it's interesting. interesting yeah. There is another process by which that happens. It is called, gross. It's though. called attraction. You know, <laughs> yeah. when you're when you're really physically pheromones. Yeah, yeah. When you're physically and drawn and attracted to someone and you kiss them and you feel that feeling or whatever. That's a terrible gauge. Th well, that's yeah. Yeah. most people fuck that one. up. It's worse. <laughs> it's it's worked for most of human history. Most people can't can't decipher that from horny. It's, 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 a, it's a really <laughs> fine. It's a really fine line yeah. there. But yeah. people don't understand. Hey, and man, it's a powerful one. It's worked for most of human history. You know, that's that's how we pick our and you if you look at the, the actual rate of genetic disorders is very rare it's worked pretty damn well you know it's the reason why you're not attracted to your siblings for the most part oh. you know yeah, how much God. is it you know how much is the, the, the testing app. i don't know but you weren't talked to again that's twice excuse me, <laughs> <laughs> excuse me sir totally contribute. Yeah. uh i don't know what it would maybe doug can look it up look up the uh, d-i-g-i-d-8 uh, uh app how much i think it's just an app so I think it's more about traffic. I don't think it's about them charging to do it. It's probably I, just like any of those other ones yeah. out there. Yeah, well, like who would do, harm yeah, who's or whatever. doing the genetic testing? Probably a doctor. No, I think it's like an at-home thing. I'm sure you have mm -hmm. to fill it out. Yeah, yeah, so you'd have to pay for that. Mm -hmm. Maybe, yeah. I would assume so. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine that will do well. Like yeah. how much do those, what was the app that you said you were doing the last, what's it called? Hinge? Yeah. Hinge. What does that cost? Nothing. Oh, that's free. Well, you can I know pay the league, more. The league you, can, you can pay more to get more features. Like oh. super like. So you actually shit. started dating like an average guy because you didn't pay for the, the upgrade? <laughs> <laughs> so you, you, well, I think it says something about someone who pays for the upgrade, right? Oh, it does? What does it say? I it's, don't know. So you, just, you're more you're desperate? you too much time on the app. You're too <laughs> into it? Is that what it is? Yeah, I think so. I don't know. What if they or have, you just want to go right to the top. Well, yeah, well, exactly. Yeah, no, what if there's what a whole other class of people yeah. that you didn't get access to? I don't know. 
Oh my God. Do you imagine that? If you get ranked by people in a dating app and then that rank determines how accessible you are by other people. And if yeah. they don't match the number, they can accept, access you. Yeah, they they got to pay though. They got to pay for it. They got to pay for it. Ooh, you know what I'm saying? That's like clever. Exclusivity. I'm a 9.5, know. you know? So huh? you gotta, yeah. Like, so for a hinge, if you pay more, you can see everyone who likes you at the same time versus if you don't pay, you have to go one by one. What do you, Does what, that make sense? No, no, no. Explain that again. So you could get, so what she's saying is if you pay, then you see all the people that are interested in you all at the same time. If not, then you have to swipe through one at a time. Mm. Now, why that would be, I could see a Because uh, we live alluring. in this, this binge. This well, because you'd want to compare everybody. Yeah. It's like, you know, when you're making a deal, you want to see like, well, I want to hear what they have to say too first. You know? <laughs> that yeah, you're pretty, pretty, yeah, you're pretty hot, but I don't know what else is coming up next. It's I, easier to say no if you see someone better above them, right? Yeah. But if you're going one by one, you're like, what, is, what if this is the best see, one I get? How, how many bad dates do you have to do before you get a good one? What's the what's the average? It depends on your screening process. Oh, well, what's your screening process? I mean, I'm picky about who I'll go on a date with. Yeah. So, you so like I don't a, have, like I a, haven't had that many bad dates. So what? So you have like, a, you got to fill out like a questionnaire to go with you or something? I mean, mm. you know me. Yeah. Every yeah. person I've ever gone on a date with says, I feel like I was just in a podcast interview. Oh my <laughs> God. Oh, that's <laughs> super hot. That's still yeah. Yeah. It's it's definitely. It's, 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 <laughs> get shit done. Getting yeah. them all revved up, huh? <laughs> yeah. 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 Do, you guys, do you guys feel like these apps that just increase, just dramatically increase your accessibility to lots and lots of different people? Do you feel like at some point that's going to cause issues where people are so indecisive because they feel like there's sure. so many people out there? Don't you feel too many options? Don't What's you happening f- now? Don't you feel that way already with yeah. streaming movies? Mm, that's I mean, true. Go no, on Netflix, yeah. you don't watch anything. No, yeah. it's like, I have like decision fatigue. I re- yeah, I remember as a kid having like 30 video cassettes and yeah. every night watching a movie. So I watched all of those movies probably and never having a hard time picking Dude, them. I loved walking in the movie store because you could just like walk through the aisles and then you finally make a decision. It's like, ah, oh, you don't have that anymore. It's just like you have to know what you're going to watch. Well, you're overwhelmed. There's it, so much. It's funny too because in the past, uh, people got married and they stayed married for a long time and- you know, now that we've gotten into more of like dating and more access to more people, that percentage has gone down. So I wonder if that plays a role. If you think, because you have, there's so many people out there that I'm less likely to work on what I need to work on I think it's done more good than bad. I think there's a majority of people that um, it really helps. I think, uh, you know, most people are probably not very self-aware and socially aware. And so having an app that actually helps filter for you um, probably does a service. Especially people with baggage. Yeah, it probably does it does a service for a lot of people that probably are just not there yet. They haven't done the reps. They haven't dated enough people to know like, oh, you probably shouldn't be dating this guy or oh, every this this is your MO for a reason because you're still dealing with your old shit where you put everything as a on a profile. And you allow people to filter each other out like that. I would think that it it, it helps more people than it, it hurts. Yeah, I, I could see that, but I could also see the flip where you, you know in the past you got with someone and you didn't necessarily compare them to all these other people. Maybe even through media, maybe you didn't compare them to all these you know impossible <clears throat> ideals. And you're just like, this is my partner, and we're going to work together, and this is what we do, and here's our purpose, and all that kind of stuff. So I can also see some of the some of the drawbacks you see uh more of these pro- the more and more access people have to more and more partners the more challenges you see with that because of that perception like oh i can just have you know what i mean way more than than before you know speaking of relationships um how are you going to do over there, Justin, with uh, us ending our relationship with Skinny Dipped? Oh, oh yeah. Dude, you just hit me right there. Right. Oh. Are you okay what? with that? Are you okay with that or what? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. What am I going to have in between podcasts? <laughs> yeah. You know, that was my go-to. Just, uh, yeah, I don't know. We're going to have to We're gonna have to find something. Justin's going to yeah. get lean. You're going to get lean. I'm just going to get lean <laughs> and mean. Shred- I'm going to be shredded. all shredded. <laughs> I think so, I might compete next this year. This is our last mention of Skinny Dipped Almonds, right? Yeah, yeah I believe so. Doug, did you look that up to see if it was our final? He says he thinks oh, so. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Good, great company, though. I love love the ladies. I love what they're doing. The brand is continuing to grow and do well. Uh, and I know that uh, we talked about potentially going on for 2020 with them, but I know that they're going to use uh, some of their advertising money elsewhere and other places. So uh, the people that I'm sure will eventually ask, what happened? Yeah. There's not, there was, it was completely- going to stockpile it all. No, it was completely amicable. And, and uh, you know we look forward to seeing them continue to grow and, and do well. And I'm sure- uh, Justin will continue his skinny dipped uh, yeah. addiction. addiction. I'll be your yeah. number one uh, uh, customer <laughs> yeah. on the side. Exactly. Yeah. Dude, uh, I got some, I, I pulled up some very interesting statistics the other day that I thought were incredibly fascinating. 
um, in, regor- in regards to poverty. Um, some economists did uh, some really, really deep work, and this is actually well known. I went and looked it up even further, did some cross you know, referencing or whatever, and I found that this is actually quite well known. I just wasn't familiar with this, this statistic. But there are three things that if you do these three things in life, uh, your your odds of living in poverty are reduced by uh, dramatic uh, percent, something like uh, over seventy five percent reduction in your chances of living in poverty. If you just do the following three things, you guys want to guess what they are? Save mm. half of what you make. Uh, see, go ahead, keep going. Any any others, Justin? Get educated. I don't know yeah. what we're talking about. Here. So so I was I would think it would be along those lines too, like you know work this long or whatever. But no, there's these, these are the following three things. And they found that if people just follow these three things, that, the, that they're probably going to be in the middle class. Number one, this one's obvious, keep a full-time job. So don't work part-time, work full-time, obviously. Graduate high school. So not even college, just don't, don't drop out of high school. And then the third one, this one's really important, wait to have children until you're married or and older than 21. So people who have kids mm. out of wedlock, and especially people who have kids out of wedlock under the age of 21, the odds that they're going to live in poverty are astronomical. Mm-hmm. It's like very, very high odds. So people who followed all three of those rules, 75% of them joined the middle class just for following those three things. Yeah. Full-time job, graduate high school, wait till you have kids until you're married and older than 21. Old, good old-fashioned you know, advice. I mean, it makes sense. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, and isn't, I mean, the average age now is much higher than what it was before as far as kids getting married and having uh, kids, right? The I think the iGen book got into that. I think that stats up into the mid-20s it's now. starting to go up. It's starting to go up. I think uh, kids are starting to, to uh, value it a little bit differently. Yeah. So although rates of marriage are going down, the people who are getting married seem to be, it looks like divorce rates are actually going to start to reverse uh, is what they think. But pretty interesting, right? No, oh, yeah, yeah. pretty That's crazy. Really interesting. M- more interesting information. Did you guys know that Italians are the world's healthiest people? <laughs> <laughs> Is this more like <laughs> let's hear this bias. cherry pick? Let's the hear this data bias that you're study. finding out here. Yeah, yeah. Wilkes. no, no. Bloomberg just put out uh, put this out and ranked the world's just generally speaking in terms of overall health. Um, and Italians uh, ranked uh, the highest among all developed nations, so higher than anybody else. And the reason why this made kind of news is because, you know, Italians eat things like bread and pasta mm. and, you know, they, they yeah, drink magical wine. Magical pasta out there? What's yeah. happening? Well, uh, so I want to, I, I think this is an interesting thing to talk about because Italians do eat a lot of pasta and bread and they do drink uh, a lot of wine, but they also do eat a lot of vegetables and fruits. And the article, the, the, the authors of the article were looking to the diet of Italians to try and find out why they're so healthy, but I think they make a big mistake there. Mm-hmm. I don't think it's necessarily the diet, although I think it plays a role. I think family, it had, the yes. lifestyle. The, That's it. Family, the sun exposures, water, sun. Activities. It's a very family uh, and, yeah. and leisure-centric uh, yeah. uh, uh, you know, culture. <laughs> All the stereotypes. Just, it's, How are they <laughs> defining healthy? Uh, by longevity, um, by there's a lot of different factors. So how long people lived, how sick they got, how much hospital time they had to, you know, just overall uh, health. And then there were also things like how happy people were. Um, but th- th- I think it has to do more with their lifestyle. It's a very family centric, uh, kind of leisure centric uh, culture. Um, ask anybody who's ever been to Italy for any length of period of time, they'll tell you, oh man, I love the way people are over there. They they hang out, they have a long lunch, you know, they they make time for each other. They, they So siestas, huh? They value connection and friend and stuff like Spain that. It's not Spain that does that, right? That's not yeah. in Italy. Oh, you don't do that there? They do, in Southern Italy, they do something similar. Well, they that, go home and like, they eat, they eat dinner at like one o'clock with their family, take a nap and then go back to work for another hour. See, that's two. interesting to me though, because like, so half of their day, like they'll take out, but they actually don't open up clubs or anything till like 12 at midnight. And then it's like, they stay up all night till like three in the morning or whatever. Then they start the day over. So it's like, it, I don't know. It's, it's like, just the young kids. Yeah. Uh, I don't think yeah. Old, old maybe. People, right? Dude, They're one old. thing that I noticed that was that in Italy was in the summertime. First of all, m- a lot of people take the whole month of August off. Like that's like a big thing Why? in the culture of Italy. It's just a thing that they do. They take August off. A lot of a lot of places shut down and closed down. When I went to go visit, there was a gym in the town that I was in, and it was closed for August. And I was like, what the, the whole the whole month? <laughs> yeah. I can't work out. They closed the gym. Wow. Really? Rest, yeah. Restaurants and bars and grocery stores. Really? Yes. 
um, especially the further south that you There's go. There's got to be history to huh. that. Why Why August? It's, um, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. I know Celebrating that, something. Yeah, there's something there, but I don't know. Um, but then when you go out at night in the summer, 10, 11 o'clock at night, it's not just the kids that are out at the bars. It's moms and dads pushing strollers with the kids. It's grandparents. It's, yeah. It's such a- Strange. It's such a family, you know, centric, you know, connection centric culture. That's what I think- Mm-hmm. Is is due to their, their their the reason why they're considered the world's healthiest according to Bloomberg. You know, you bringing up Bloomberg, you make me. Uh, I haven't asked you in a while. You haven't dropped some politics on us in a while. What's going on with? Uh, <laughs> uh, is Trump getting impeached right now or what? There. What's the deal? Well, here's my opinion um, on that whole process. I think it's a, a strategy by the dem. So I, I looked at what's going on and what they're trying to impeach him on. The the what they have is I, I don't think they have what what it takes to impeach him at all. Um, although they may say that they will, I think this is a strategy to uh, to beat him for the upcoming election because mm. the economy's crushing. Um, the stock market, I think, went up ten thousand points since he's been in office. Something insane like that, it's hitting records all the time. Unemployment is at record lows, uh, especially for minorities. Um, the Democrats have weak candidates at best. They don't have, they don't have anybody really exciting. On their side, and they know it. Biden was supposed to be their guy, mm-hmm. but the guy puts his foot his foot in his mouth. Oh my god, such like cringeworthy. Uh, like lately, did you watch that video where he was talking to like all these kids about? I don't even remember what he exactly <laughs> said, but it was about like rubbing his leg. And yeah. I, oh what? my god, it was so cringeworthy. Somebody made a cartoon about it. Uh, it was it was terrible. It was bad. It was like it really will yeah. make your skin. Crawl. I feel like this is part of the strategy because the impeachment will will stretch this whole process will stretch throughout the election oh wow so this won't we won't know the answer no to it. i mean and they're going to probably go back and forth and they'll be able to bring up like you know like as the election's going on like oh here's another thing that they brought up during the hearings here's another thing so it'll, it'll i think what they're trying to do is attack his character it's a very smart strategy if you ask me yeah. if i was on the democrat side well, it's a hell mary right? and yeah if i was on that side and i'm looking at the economy i'm looking at his support which he has public support is better than it than it's been you know been, than it's been for other presidents during this time in their term, yeah. um, I would be like, "What do we?" And I'd look at my candidates and be like, "What do we got?" I just we heard- have Biden, we have uh, Elizabeth Warren, we have uh, you know uh, what's his Sanders. name, Bernie. Like they don't yeah. got good. They don't have. What's going on with candidates. Bloomberg? Bloomberg supposedly is still going to run, but uh, I what don't. Did, what did I don't you think say about taxing poor people? Like, so I was like, uh, really? That's what you're going to yeah, come some, out with? Some video came out where he said it's a good thing to tax poor people because it motivates them. Because <laughs> it motivates <laughs> them. Like, did anybody like just coach you on <laughs> this? Yeah. Blue- Someone forgot to tell him he's the one yeah. percent. <laughs> yeah. I don't think I, I didn't get received well. Yeah. I don't think the Democrats will let Bloomberg win the nomination to run as a Democrat. He's yeah. a he's a he's a billionaire. He's part of that side that they they don't like. Against. They don't like him, and they don't like the other girl, right? Those are the two that probably have the biggest chance. Him yeah. or the um, Tulsi Gabbard? Yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Tulsi Gabbard. Yeah, she's uh, she's probably the, too reasonable. She's, she's the one to that's make it. Veteran, veteran, Hispanic, right? Yeah, she's anti uh, anti war. She already got attacked by the Clintons, though. Um, no way they'll let her get the nomination. Yeah. I think it'll still be Biden. I think he's the guy to to do it. But Biden's I don't, he's weak. He's just yeah. not a strong candidate. They don't really have. I mean, Obama was a strong candidate. If, if, if there was an Obama, Trump would be in trouble because that guy could get on a stage and just, I mean, he was one of the best at- He's at a great Jenner's. speaker. He was just phenomenal, phenomenal. He came across as just uh, amazing. They don't have anybody like that. And no. Trump is, the economy's, cr- unless something really bad happens to the economy. Yeah. So I see this as being their strategy. They're like, what are we going to do? Let's do this impeachment. This will help. I heard this. Him. I don't know how true this is or not, but also too with the the tariffs in, in China, there was another angle to that in terms of fentanyl, like that being a major source of where the fentanyl is coming from in this whole opioid epidemic. Oh, I didn't know this. Yeah, and so like a lot of the factories out there, are like you know, that's where they're getting it from, and it's making its way into like every drug. So it's not just like like you, you know pills and. Uh, powders that like they're finding traces of fentanyl in heroin. What, finding, what, are you, what are you talking about right now? Fentanyl what? being like one of the major problems, right? Epidemic right now, oh. like, especially through the Midwest. Like a lot of people are are uh, dying. Like there was thirty thousand people reported dying. From Is that because people are cutting it with it, or are yes? They, oh, okay, and they're importing it from China. And they're importing it from China. And oh, there's these big factories. Why fentanyl? Is it making something? It. Is it because it still gives them a high or something? It's what? an opiate. It's an opiate. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So and so and if, of it or whatever. And if there's a whole bunch of it flooding the market would make sense yeah 
Okay. Yeah. It's a big problem that people aren't talking about. Yeah, with the, as far as the, the China thing is going on, uh, China is looking kind of interesting because you have Hong Kong right now that's protesting like crazy. I mean, millions of people. You guys know the whole deal of China, right? The whole deal that's going on over there? No. You guys have seen those those protests? No. What? So oh, it, Hong it's Kong? in Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah. Hong Kong. So, You're talking about the same ones that have been going since the NBA, the whole NBA talk that we talked about how they no, were. No, so so in, in Hong Kong, you that know, was part as of you guys know, was controlled yeah. by the you know, by you know Great Britain or whatever, United Kingdom. Then they went to China, but the deal was that for 50 years, I think it was 1997 that Hong Kong went to China. The deal was that for 50 years, China could not would leave Hong Kong alone. It was independent, basically. No, well, well, they're under of. they're under China, but they're left alone. Yeah. We're gonna leave you guys alone. We're not gonna do anything. And then China passed a law that said that they can extradite people from Hong Kong to the mainland of China mm. for whatever reason. And this is bad, obviously, because there's lots of anti-communist you know people in Hong Kong who write articles and blogs. And so if that law passed, that means China could go to Hong Kong, grab them, grab them, bring them back to China. So that started this, um, this huge wave of protest. And maybe also because the 50 years is going to be coming up here in the next, you know, 20 years or whatever, um, that they're kind of like, Oh, what's going to happen. So they did all these protests. China said, backed off and said, okay, we're not going to, we're not going to implement that law. We're not, but there's, they're, they're still protesting. Mm. And, and I've read that the protests are spreading to mainland uh, China because there are regions wow. in China that have a lot of uh, people that go back and forth between Hong Kong and China. So that's bad. Then that's they got to be volatile. We saw videos of like, you know, just people like uh, doing things against like whatever. <clears throat> what was that called? Like where they had that structure where it's like a point system that they've created. Oh, their social, through, yeah, social so, scoring system. The social scoring system. Is that happening? System. Yeah, in they're China. already like punishing people. It, for, it is happening. Yeah. Yeah. I thought that was like they were testing that. That's like full on. Uh, I don't know if it's fully implemented, but they're doing it. Wow. It's, it's moving forward. Now, do you talk? Does uh, do you and Arthur Brooks? Does he send you articles? Or are you still talking to him about stuff like this? Uh, every once in a while, we'll send articles to each other. Yeah, I'd love. But to you hear know, the thing about here's the thing about communism in these days is that it's so hard unless you completely shut off your country, like North Korea. Um, it's 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 hard. Information comes in and out. So mm -hmm. Chinese citizens see the free world. They they taste it a little bit. They have friends and family, maybe who live in Hong Kong and they hear about, because Hong Kong is at the freest economy in the world. They have a Western style judicial system. They have protected rights and all that stuff. So here they are in, 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 in communist China. They start, they hear about this stuff. Mm -hmm. People start to want it. And once that spreads, boy, that's like a fire you can't put out. And then on top of it, you throw this tariff war between China and the US, which um, it's costing us money, but it's hurting them a little more. Yeah. Um, so they're in a, a bit of a precarious situation. Well, one cool thing that's come out of China, I, I just saw recently that there was a finding of a dinosaur tail that had feathers still intact. Isn't what? that isn't that the theory? Like, did, didn't you? Yeah. Wasn't it you who brought that up? I, I had yeah. never heard that before. That that this whole idea that dinosaurs were bald is a bunch of bullshit. They probably all had feathers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was like sort of they, they were they're kind of moving that in that direction, but they didn't have any definitive evidence for that. So they're speculating, but I guess they found. And this is kind of also like I'm still on the fence with it because they actually found it in a marketplace. They found this this piece of amber that encased a, a, a tail of this 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 dinosaur. Let me see. It's the uh, theropod dinosaur. So uh, it's, apparently it was from the Cretaceous period, about 99 million years ago. Which, however, they they figure that out. But uh, they just found it in the market and they had it studied. And all these people are studying it right now. But there, it's it's showing that they did have feathers and it's it's pretty like uh, conclusive evidence. So yeah, pull up a picture of that. I want to see yeah, that. Because aren't, aren't chickens like the closest relative to, to Yeah, dinosaurs? that's what I've heard too. Yeah. That, that, yeah. And that's I, why they were speculating. They may have the feathers. Now, didn't somebody make a dinosaur embryo from chicken DNA? That's or Jurassic. is that? You would dress <laughs> yeah, yeah, I saw that movie too. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. I thought they actually, somebody's actually did that. Already. Really? Yeah. I, I knew they were trying to make uh, mammoths. <laughs> Uh, no, oh, that's, that's what they look real. like. Yeah. He looks like a chicken. Oh wow! Yeah, well, that's a like a chicken fucked a pterodactyl. Wow, <laughs> <laughs> that's what it looks like. <laughs> Tell me, it doesn't look like a chicken? Show me the video, a, right? Yeah, pterodictyl. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, wow, that's yeah. not the picture of the thing. No, Doug, it's not. can you? Oh, see, that's not. Here. Can you look up if uh, if we actually made um, uh, we made a, a dinosaur embryo from chicken DNA? I thought I thought someone did that, or they're thinking about doing that. That was in the Jimmy Neutron movie. Was it? <laughs> Yeah. What? Jimmy Neutron? I didn't watch that one. What? what is that I one? I just texted you, you too Doug. Old. Oh, God. <laughs> Amber specimen. Don't uh, do that. To see us. right there. Scientists recreate. A click on. Oh, that's Snopes. It's probably fake. 
Uh, Never mind. Yes. No, <laughs> debunks yeah. all that kind of stuff. Yeah, huh? you guys you guys might be right. Uh, yeah, well, we'll see what happens. Well, I texted that. To Scientists you, are having a lot of fun with I mean, this. how do we determine it's a dinosaur, not like an old chicken? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> what do you mean? A big chicken. <laughs> yeah, and that's right. Is this the Based size? Based of the uh, age of the... Uh, well, if you're talking about like the bones, or you're talking about like yeah, the well, fossil, you, you said it's like a tail with some feathers. Like, I mean, it's it, because of the tail. fossil of the amber. So they somehow they can carbon date or whatever they do. Oh, with that. what it's trapped in. Yeah. Have you ever looked into the accuracy of that? Have, who, <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. <laughs> huh? I know. I know. You're not have you ever Have you ever looked into how accurate that is? No, we just. Well, all... it relates to nutrition, right? Everyone thinks they know what we used to eat. We don't. Yeah. Yeah. You I know. know. It's. There, I'm sure there's some shenanigans involved. Well, when it comes but... to nutrition, it's a little bit different because carbon dating is isn't accurate. Like you can't guess guess within ten years, but you can guess within hundreds or thousands of years. Yeah. So you know, we know that it's you know hundreds of thousands of years old and we know that it's going to be around that we might not know the exact date or whatever as far as nutrition is concerned the best evidence we have are either seeds that they'll leave that they'll leave fossilized poop you know they'll find like fossilized poop and we'll analyze it and they'll say oh we found it's fibers or drawings or yeah, drawings of the of the food that they have but you're right uh, i i think humans are opportunistic so when it comes to nutrition we probably just ate whatever was in front of us or whatever we could find. You know what I mean? Yeah, there's a lot of fl- I mean, history is kind of riddled with that. Like you're just trying to piece it all back together. You don't know what really happened. Well, I mean, was it's just any, like was, it's a narrative that yeah, we was all was anyone agree on. dieting before the fifties? But dieting? Yeah. When oh, did, when, did diet, when did dieting start? Like bro, they didn't, they didn't, they could, they didn't start before. You used to be able to order mail order pills. For weight loss, and I believe it was in the. I remember those old ads, Early, like the twenties or thirties. That far back? Tapeworms. Really? Yes. I so you used it. to be able yeah, to buy. I that. This was in the early nineteen hundreds. You could buy tapeworms. So before the nineteen hundreds, so nobody was doing. Oh, that. I don't know. Eighteen, eighteen, anything or below, before nobody like bloodletting. You know, right. Nobody was doing yeah. that. The only you know who was probably dieting were uh, the, the wealthy because they were you know maybe get too fat so they tell their. And servants. even then, I thought back then it was like it was a sign of wealth. It was a sign yeah. of wealth. Yeah, right. So you would be proud to be a little a little chunky. A little, I know. A little you, rotund. You go two hundred years back. You imagine telling somebody, yeah, I'm not going to eat that because I, <laughs> I want to try and lose some weight. Yeah. Like, what the my six pack. And then I'm going to go to this place and lift things for no reason <laughs> you're crazy anyway yeah. speaking of time we got our five-year anniversary coming up yeah no I'm, I'm pretty excited uh i've been talking to shauna over at organifi for the last few months about planning our five year in san diego at their headquarters oh that's great so the last time when i flew down there and uh got a chance to check out the new place it's it's awesome it's got a really cool layout it's uh it's massive we could probably comfortably fit easily two to three hundred people in there and uh, we've talked about it on this show for a long time about doing some sort of a mind pump party or get together i think that uh, this makes the most sense. It's our five-year anniversary, and one of our best partners. Yeah, what we don't know yet. So, like, we we literally just she just emailed me over uh, the the spreadsheet that we're going to start, you know, uh, adding what we want there as far as you know, food and and drink and uh, you know, entertainment or what that's going to look like. Because I think it's going to be uh, less like our live events, like we've done, where we go and we talk for a long old time, and it's more mingling. I think it's to be more of a party. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure we'll get up there Maybe and like say a if, band or a DJ or something. Yeah, so yeah. that's what we're we're kind of exploring some of that. So I don't know exactly it's, what it's, it's going to look like. I know it's going to be in August of next year, mm-hmm. so we have plenty of time to to plan it. It will be held at Organifi at their headquarters. It'll um, be like a kombucha kager. And it will be open to the public, but it'll once we get X amount of people that sign up for it, it'll be closed off. So, mm-hmm. um, and I gotta I gotta find out from Shauna what's the total amount of people that we can fit in there. But I'm excited. I think it's gonna be a, a really good time. How long have we been partnering with? We've worked with Organifi. It's been three years now. Yeah, they were one of the mm-hmm. very first sponsors. It's yeah. been so three years. Chimera right? was the official first one, right? Mm-hmm. So we did Chimera for a few months before. I think we found Organifi, and then Organifi has been the probably the the the, Organifi for Sigmatic, and who else was uh, early one? But those are the longest. Those are the longest running ones. Yeah, yeah, for Mm -hmm. sure. And Organifi has exploded since we started working with them. I'm not saying it was us, but I'm saying it was. (laughs) I'm saying it was not all of it anyway. (laughs) Either I mean I. I've been down there now a couple times and and met with their team, and you know they they have a, a really tight business model. I mean, mm-hmm. they, they, and it, tell you what, uh, you know, they've won, I think I talked about this before, right? They, they've won the best place to work, uh, yep. you know, Inc 500 thing yep. a couple times in a row, like, you know, and you can feel it when you walk into the place, like the vibe is just, 
you can tell everybody just loves working there. It's a very cool atmosphere, and um, the, everybody from the the tech nerdy side of it all the way to the customer service, everyone is. The, t- the two things for me that that made such a big impact for me from this company was the when we when they when we first started working with us, and they sent us a protein. And I can't take I can't have dairy protein, so for me, it's always going to be typically a, a vegan based type protein powder. The taste was amazing, so that was like, whoa, you guys did a good job. But the other thing that really struck me was during that whole time when I forgot who it was, I think it was Consumer Reports, was testing vegan protein powders and finding high amounts of heavy metals. And you guys know how, like I got like, hold on a second. And I contacted Organifi and the response and the quickness with, you know, here's what our products have, here's what the testing shows, um, really showed that they are dedicated to providing, you know, good, good product because I was ready, man. I was ready. Like if you don't give me the what I want, we're going to have to bounce. No, it'd be interesting to see how they uh, they line up business and revenue wise to some of the other big ones because I think they're now at a place where they for sure are rivaling them. Or if they if they have not taken like the Vegas and who what are the other and the uh, what's the other one um, that's in Whole Foods? Uh, Sun Warrior. No, I didn't know that was one. Oh, yeah, that's, that's a big another vegan big, one. Yeah, that's mm-hmm. another big one. I didn't even know that. Which mm-hmm. one's Sun Warrior? I'm not familiar with that I've one. I've seen it. I'd say Vega I'm thinking of gar- Garden, garden, oh, garden of Life. Garden of Life. Yeah, Garden of Life oh, is one of the- Oh, do people use that? Yeah, it's a big <laughs> one. That's yeah. in all the Whole Foods. Those are some of the bigger ones. And I think Organifi's up there with them as far as the, the size of the business now. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they're not in retail, are they? No. Yeah. No. no. Yeah, yeah. I can't, well, whew, gosh, they're as big as they are and they're not even retail. That's yeah. crazy. First question, Ander Beth, why do you think it's easier for some people to build muscle than others? Does it always come down to genetics? Oh, great question, uh, Christina. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's funny. Uh, before we talk about genetics, we need to talk about the obvious stuff that I think sometimes people push to the side and they they like to say it's all about genetics. But let's let's talk let's about talk the about other, excuses. Yeah, let's talk about the the, the other factors first. Okay. Is the person working out and training in a, in the most appropriate and effective way possible for their body? That's two things there. First, is it an effective workout? And two, is it the most effective workout for their body? Um, is that person eating a diet that is the most effective for building muscle and appropriate for the body? That's also very, very important. Is the person have a lifestyle that is conducive to building muscle, especially for their body? You got to look at all those three, three, those things first before you go on to genetics. As I, you know, I would have, you know, I knew this growing up working out, there'd be people around me who'd be building muscle and bet faster than me. And I think to myself, oh, it must be genetics or it must yeah. be steroids. One or the other. Yeah. Now that I'm older, looking back, I can see like, oh, that person ate much better than I did, or I didn't prioritize sleep yes. and they did, or I overtrained like crazy. And they just focused on the big compound lift. It kind of reminds me of like the argument that we're making about the fighting thing, the size and the skill thing, right? Like with a, fi- the, a fighter, if you have incredible skills, if you really know the tools that it takes to build muscle, you can compete even with somebody who has great genetics. Mm-hmm. I really feel that way. I think the genetics thing is just a quick excuse that we that we make because somebody else is responding and we're doing the same thing. So there's that there's those outliers, which everybody has that friend or girlfriend that they know that gets away with eating crappy food, barely touches any weight, and their body looks great. That's such a small percentage of the people. Great point, because when you look at genetics as a whole with humans, most pe- the vast majority of us f- are somewhere in the middle. M- very few of us are on the edges, on the edges. So it's like a, it's what, like a bell curve, right? Um, on the edges, very, very few people. As you get close to the middle, there's a larger, larger, larger amount of people that fit somewhere in the middle. So the, the here's the reality. The truth is, if you look around, m- most people around you have genetics that are kind of like yours. Most people are somewhere in the middle. It's rare to have these crazy superior muscle building genetics. And trust me, when you meet someone that has these type of genetics, you know. It's not a question. It's not like, hey, yeah. he gained five more pounds than me. It's more like, wow, he's 270 pounds of muscle. You yeah. know, and the guy works Not out twice. Not to mention, week. what's the the history there? Like, how long have they been in the game? Like, I know a lot of times, like people have started, you know, when they're like twelve or thirteen, and like they've built, you know, the, their body responds because they've built all this in, like over decades. And you know, like for them to to see them, they they see them just responding, you know, way later in the game, and they don't realize, like, yeah, th- this has been a whole history in the making. It's not just like right now. Well, the, the truth is, you know. Building muscle is hard. 
it takes uh, consistency. Um, it takes proper nutrition. It takes proper exercise. And the fact is, a majority of people don't have all three of those lined up. Um, most people half-ass their diet. They're not getting all the nutrients they need. And they're asking their body to respond. Most people don't do a very good job with their programming. They they mm -hmm. gravitate towards a type of modality they enjoy. And, it, and as we talk on the show all the time, that's important for consistency. But when trying to build muscle, if you're still doing the Jane Fonda tape at home, you know, and you're wondering why your body's not building more muscle, you're pretty adapted to that. Or you're going to your favorite, you know, Orange Theory F45 class and you've seen good results in the first three, six months, but you're not building any more muscle. Well, it, you're, you're, you're adapted to that way of training. So I think it's more of uh, not all of those things aligning. And most people are missing somewhere there th than it is genetics. I think that's the most common. I don't, I don't really think people know how to navigate into other modalities properly. I just don't think that they know other options, you know, well enough. Like they do, like they know they need to up their calories, right? Mm -hmm. That's like the first thing. Like most people are pretty, you know, familiar with that part of it. But, you know, people don't adjust their training uh, to, to match, you know, how their body needs to respond. So I think that's something that, you know, we need to better educate uh, the general public about. It's that. a it's a really easy, uh, you know, it's a really easy path, right, to say, oh, it's genetics. We've heard that with fat loss, too. You know, oh, I'm, I'm I can't lose weight or I'm overweight. And it's because of my genetics. Uh, you know, I know uh, my friends don't worry about, you know, and here's a funny thing, training clients, you start to to have people track and pay attention to certain things. And you start to realize, sure, genetics plays a role, but it ain't the role that you used to think. Like, I remember there was a show on, um, I want to say it was Discovery Channel, where they had people who were like morbidly obese, 400, 500 pounds, right? Mm. And they would be part of this reality show and they would get followed around. My 600 pound life. It, 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 it was one of those. <laughs> that, was a, that was a show. I think that yeah. was, yeah. yeah. It, was, it was something like that, right? And they'd get followed around with the camera. And so before the show starts, you see this interview of the person. And the person's like, yeah, I've been overweight my whole life. I grew up this way. My body stores body fat really easily. It's really crazy. And you kind of hear them making the case for, hey, look, I, I was born this way and I can't help it. Meanwhile, the camera starts following them around. And then you start to see what how they actually eat. And you get to see that for breakfast, it's five breakfast sandwiches and a soda. Yeah. Then they have a bag of, uh, a full-size bag of chips as a snack. And then lunchtime, they go through the drive through again. And then dinner, it's like a full size of pizza or they go to the grocery store and they're like, you know, um, this is healthy, right? It's chicken. Meanwhile, it's fried chicken and it's a whole bucket or whatever. Yeah. And you watch and you go, oh, this person just has no idea. Mm -hmm. They actually have no idea what a, what, a, what a proper portion looks like and they're blaming it on genetics. Just like when I was a kid trying to build muscle, I didn't know what the, I didn't, I, I thought I was eating enough or more than enough to build muscle. But when I go back and really, if I really look at the calories and grams of protein and all that stuff, it wasn't enough. I remember learning this when my parents went to Italy one uh, one year for, uh, I think it was like a month and a half or two months. I was staying at my grandma's house and obviously I have an Italian grandma, so she'll make me whatever I want. And so she's like, what do you want to eat? And I said, I love steak. Make me a lot of steak. So when I lived at my grandma's house, she made me steak two or three times a day. So two or three times a day, I'd have steak and I'd have pasta or whatever. And I remember over that course of that month and a half, I was gaining muscle like I'd never gained before. And then I pieced it together and I was like, oh, it's because... My, grand, my grandma's feeding me steak all the time. So hmm. genetics definitely play a role, but it's not the role that you think for the most part. Now, that being said, when you get to the the sides, when you get to the outliers, well, yeah, then genetics get pretty crazy. Um, now, I've worked in fitness for 20 years, so there's already a bit of a, of, a, of a selection bias. So the type of people that are attracted to fitness, the type of people that work into fitness, you're probably, you're probably already dealing with a, a level of genetics that's a little bit better than average, right? That the, most of these people are they're drawn to it because they're good at it. So I'm already, there's already a bit of a selection bias, but I can count on one hand how many people I met in 20 years working in fitness, looking back, that I could say had ins gives insane it. genetics. Yeah, I agree. You know what yeah. I'm saying? This all this also goes back to the argument that we had the other day about, or you know, debate that we were talking about, which is harder to build muscle or burn body fat. I, I think to build muscle, you, it, this also brings up another point of how there's less room for air. If you are trying to burn body fat, just moving, doesn't matter what modality, how consistent you've been doing, just moving a lot and eating less and you'll lose body weight. That's mm. just, and you can keep and you can get away with continuing to 
push that, right? More extreme, more extreme, more extreme, more extreme. You don't, and still, you don't need as much programming specific. Right. And, so, I mean, and, and you'll still see results. I mean, you could just run in place, you know, and, and eat less every single day and increase that intensity yeah, week, over week, yeah. week over week, week over week. And then you'll see the decrease in, in body fat and body weight. But with building muscle, it's it's you can't just oh if you overdo it like crazy and you're not feeding correctly, you're gonna see no results. So you could be putting in a ton of work inside the gym, not fueling the body nutritionally to support all that extra work, and your body won't build shit. Mm -hmm. In fact, a lot of times you may even lose weight in pursuit of building muscle. So I think there's a a, a sweeter spot when trying to build, which makes it feel like it's more challenging and then again defaulting to oh i'm just fucked i have bad genetics and my friend has got great genetics now it's less often that and it's more addressing some of these this yeah you know, they're not really isolating that that's very specific goal of building muscle they're not willing to then like you know like take down a lot of the extracurricular like cardiovascular type activity that they have incorporated in their plan because it makes them feel good. Well, whatever. I remember, and there's been several times in my lifting career where I had these moments where I thought I was doing everything right. And then I made this one little change and all of a sudden I add 10 pounds of muscle mm -hmm. after like beating my head against the wall for two years straight, right? Yeah. Two years straight thinking I know everything about lifting and I'm doing everything right mm -hmm. nutritionally. And then one day it dawns on me and I don't remember what I either read something or somebody told like, me got more sleep or something. Well, I was, you know, back off the basketball. I was playing basketball every single day in addition to lifting every single day. And I just couldn't keep up with the calories. And I thought because I was stuffing my face, I was eating enough, you know? And so just me like cutting out basketball and all of a sudden my body goes boom, 10 pounds, like came on me overnight. And it was like, Oh shit. Like that, that was a big difference mm -hmm. for someone like me who again was probably blaming it on genetics for the, the first half of my lifting. All right. Hans Schmid. Why does strength training require more rest than hypertrophy? Or is that much more, or is it is it that it's much more demanding? Okay, so what they're referring to oh, is when you're shit. training for maximal strength versus when you're training to build muscle. That's what hypertrophy refers to is, is actual increase in muscle size. Now, I do want to be clear. They both contribute to each other. So that's number one. Building maximal strength will cause muscle to grow. And on the flip side, getting your muscles to grow will contribute to more strength. So there's a little bit of gray area here. But when you are training for maximal strength, you typically are resting for longer periods of time in between sets. If you watch powerlifters work out, you'll notice that those guys and girls will walk around, chill, talk, or whatever for sometimes three, five minutes in between sets before going up uh, and lifting again. Whereas bodybuilders have a, a, a tendency to rest shorter, sometimes as short as 30 seconds. Sometimes you'll see a bodybuilder trying to maximize the pump and they're going 30 second rest and they're going set after set. Now, why is that? Okay. The, the adaptations your body uh, gets through exercise are very specific to the way that you train. They're very, very specific. There are some general carryovers to other things, but your body will adapt in very specific ways. So if I'm training for maximal strength, that means each of my sets has to display my maximal strength. If I'm resting 30 seconds in between sets of squats, by the second or third set, I am not maximizing my strength. I'm not lifting the most that I possibly can. I'm not practicing strength. It's impossible. I'm too fatigued. Uh, when you're training for strength, you want to train in your str at your strongest, which means you have to rest. By doing so, you're practicing the skill and training the adaptation of strength. Well, you're not. You're also you're replenishing your energy too. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and I and I forget what the uh, forget what the literature says, but it's like it's somewhere between two and three minutes. When you rest two or three minutes, the the most uh, of that is recovered completely, right? Mm -hmm. So a, a, as we go through our workout, that starts to deplete, right? Your your first few exercises you do, you're much stronger as you get further into the workout. That de that diminishes as time goes on. But there's a a sweet spot of resting to get the the maximum a maximum amount of energy replenished to do the next set, and that number falls somewhere. There's an individual variance, and it's obviously much more nuanced than what I'm saying right now. But about two to three minutes for to get the mm -hmm. maximum energy replenished to go after that set again. Whereas if you're cutting your rest periods at a minute or less. You're not you're not allowing your body to fully recover to to give it its most each which you don't care about mm -hmm. when you're chasing hypertrophy when you're trying to get the pump and we're and we're, that's more of uh, your desired outcome 
you're not really concerned that, oh, I if I would have rested uh, one more minute, I could have got an extra five pounds out of that set. You're not worried about it because you're not in that phase of training. And so right. it's- uh, and, and, you, and you build muscle. Hypertrophy comes from training for strength, but it also comes from uh, things like the pump from those metabolic stresses that you get from. That's why when you do like, um, was it BFR training? Occlusion training. Occlusion training is a type of training where you tie off, let's say, your arm with a with a knee with a knee wrap, and then you do curls, and your 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 muscle can't pump out the waist because it's been tied off, and so it builds up, and you're only using five or ten pounds. That's shown to build muscle, but that's probably from the the metabolic waste uh, stress that's caused. So, building muscle comes from a lot of different ways, not just getting stronger, but getting mm -hmm. stronger has to be trained specifically if you want to maximize strength. Now there, there's there's nothing to um, you know the way we lay out of our programs. There's obviously a, a systematic approach, and we think that the, these are some of the most ideal ways to to mess with tempo and timing and uh, sets and reps. But there's nothing that says you can't mess with this. Like there's times where I'll go in and I'll be following a strength type protocol as far as uh, the rep count and the weight that I'm lifting. But then I'll just cut my short my rest period shorter. I'll do uh, heavy singles. Um, with short rest periods in between. I'll go over, rip it off the ground, rest for maybe one minute or less, go right back, rip it off the ground again, and do things like that. And the same is true for messing with your hypertrophy training every once in a while. You know, uh, instead of only giving yourself a one minute rest on hypertrophy training, you know, try resting for three minutes and then do a set. You'll be able to lift more weight when you do it. So there's nothing wrong with manipulating the, the rest periods. It's just that when most people write programs or when you read most of the, the literature around this, you'll see like, oh, hypertrophy training is considered, you know, eight to 12 reps with 90 second rest periods. And it doesn't mean that you can't play with in, that. In fact, if you only stay there, you're going to, you're going to diminish your muscle building hypertrophy. Or if you only stay in strength training and you never move out of it, I think you're going to minimize your strength. Mm -hmm. We have friends like uh, Ben Pollock who trained bodybuilding for a while. Now he's finding that he's stronger going back to powerlifting because he trained for a little while in bodybuilding. Stan Efferding talked about this. And the reverse, people who only train trying to maximize the pump and build muscle, who never train for maximal strength, they'll gain benefit from That's why I said that there's a gray area because they definitely contribute to each other. And it's not because it's more demanding. Powerlifters aren't resting longer because it's harder. Uh, bodybuilding training is harder. Training like a bodybuilding will is, is will gas you out more yeah, than you're training fighting like fighting through a bunch of other factors, you yep. know, through that whole process. So it's like a couple different things that you know you're trying to to work through the fatigue that's that's inevitably like on setting. And uh, with with strength training, you're trying to be the purest form of like I can. I can have access to this this ultimate strength that I can output like at any given moment right now. And so that's the entire focus of it. It's like, what can I summon right now and how can I repeat that process? To repeat that process, I need adequate rest to then regenerate that type of force. Think about it this way. If you want to get faster, you need to train fast. If you want to get stronger, you need to train strong. Uh, if you want to build muscle, there's a little bit of gray area. Um, same thing with the others. If you want to get fast, it means that sometimes your training will be a little slow, but most of the time you should probably train quickly. Um, same thing with power training. If you look at like plyometrics, if you want to improve your explosive power, then your sets and your training need to display that. And working to fatigue means you're not going to be able to display that. So that's why there's a difference between the two. But for most of you people listening right now, you'll benefit from doing both. Yep. And I recommend you stay, you do one for a little while and then move to another one and do that one for a little while. That will give you better overall results long term. And most people listening are interested in both. They want to get strong. They also just want to build muscle and sculpt their body. Next question is from Thunderbolt. Is there ever a need to go above 12 reps or are you wasting your time after that? Oh my God, yes. Oh, totally. You know what? This is, uh, again, you know, talking about pivotal moments in my, you know, strength training or muscle building career. Uh, I remember the first time I started doing 15 to 20 reps <laughs> and I actually had some of the it's like death. Oh, well, I had some of the best gains because up until that point, I believe that anything over six reps was a waste of time. If mm -hmm. I was a skinny guy trying to build muscle, why would I ever want to do, you know, endurance type training or high repetitions that was for girls that wanted to tone their muscles that wasn't for young skinny guys like me who wanted to build muscle and so i was always lifting heavy six to eight reps at most mm -hmm. and man when i started training in the 15 to 20 rep range i blew up and i remember going like what the fuck 
this is the secret was mm-hmm. to yeah. lift high reps. And in, the truth is it, it wasn't that it was 15 to 20 reps that I never trained there. So if you're asking this question and you never go beyond 12 reps because you think it's wasting your time, it's the opposite is going to be true. If you go lift 15, 20 reps, I bet you, you see some of the greatest gains you've seen in your programming just by simply doing that. Oh, for, I swear, my legs grew. My legs tend to grow pretty easily anyway, but they never grew as much as they did when I did 20 rep sets of squat. Uh, and by the way, that, that's br- brutal. It's absolutely grueling to do anything over 10, re- uh, 10 reps, excuse me, of barbell squats. And I did sets of 20 with light weight and my legs mm. literally exploded. No, and studies show this, by the way, 20 reps, 25 reps. If the intensity is high and the form is good, yeah. that will send a ver- all rep ranges. I would say under 25 or 30, even 30 will build some muscle, especially in beginners or as a, as a, as a occasional novel, you know, rep range. But for most of you listening right now, your rep range can be up to 25, I yeah. would say. I would, yeah, and I definitely, I mean, I agree with you guys in terms of changing it up and having that response. However, there are some exercises I probably wouldn't do 20 reps with, like a deadlift, for instance, sure. or like any kind of a power uh, focused exercise. Like just eliminate a certain like amount of, yeah, exercises from that protocol. I definitely think it's worth exploring, you know, that high rep range, but be appropriate in terms of like the programming of the exercises. So I've gone back and forth on how I feel about that uh, because. The value that I find from deadlifting and squatting really high rep like that is just that if in order to deadlift 15 to 20 reps or squat 15 to 20, I have to go really light. Mm-hmm. And then, and it forces, it just, it's a, it's a lot of practice. So it's a lot of practice with a, a weight that I can control really well. Um, and I, I find that part of it, be, as far as the muscle building aspect of it, I agree with you. Like, you're going to get your biggest bang for your buck when you're doing a big compound lift on that, when you're doing, you know, singles to five reps out of those types of exercises. That's where you're going to see the most muscle, the most adaptation CNS wise you're going to get from that. But, you know, there's an argument to be made on just the fact of doing 15 to 20 reps forces you to practice that movement. And if there's a movement that more people, I think, need to practice. I would, I could make the case that squatting and deadlifting are are two of those. Squatting more so, deadlifting. Yeah, y- you know, that's right. you yeah. got to be careful, and, and and you can do it. You can definitely do it. I've done it. Um, here's the problem: once you start to go up to higher reps, the fatigue is what stops the set. Right. That's, that's why you have to go super light. Y- yeah. Again, yeah. Super light. It's, but it, it almost seems like. Uh, the I risk starts to get higher. You know, here's where it doesn't make sense at all. It almost and, seems nil at yeah, that point and, and, when you're lifting that light. And I can see what you're both saying, and I can see that there could be some value. You just got to go really light and be perfect, but definitely not with power. Uh, you know, hang cleans and snatches, terrible high idea. reps, terrible. Terrible. The, the, the risk goes through the roof once your form breaks down just a tiny bit, and you're going to do that for 15 reps. You better be using a broomstick because once your form breaks down just a little bit, that exercise now became dangerous, very dangerous. Okay, next question is from Gretch. <laughs> what, are, what are some strategies to avoid burnout as a trainer and tips for making time to train yourself? You guys remember the first time you burned out as a trainer? <laughs> when I first became a, a, a we trainer. Like 12 appointments in a row. Yeah, I was yeah. so. It was early for me, man. I, 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 I fell in love with the job and I quickly fell more in love with coaching trainers over actually training clients. Training uh, clients is fucking draining. Dude, it's hard. It's, it's- I, Drudgery when if you I, make it. When I first became a trainer, I was so excited to be a trainer, to be working in a gym that I just took all clients, yeah. any clients, any time, as many as possible. Which I think there's a lot of value in that. There is at first. Yeah, and at I remember it, it was like, I remember my schedule was something like I'd get in at 8 a.m. and I'd work till 1. Then I'd have like a break for like an hour or two. Then I'd get back to work and I'd work till like 9 p.m. Then I'd go home. Then I'd come back at 3 a.m. because I had like these clients that nobody wanted to train. You know, I worked at a 24 hour fitness gym. So someone wants to buy training, but they only couldn't work out at 3 a.m. I'll do it. You know, so I come back and I go back home and go sleep. And I did that. And I was young and I was 18, I had lots of energy, but I remember it starting to like burn me out where your eyes burn and your body tingles because you're tired and you're just like, <laughs> my workouts are starting to suck. Yeah. So I think number one, uh, for most trainers, the, t- the most amount of clients you probably on a long-term basis, I'm not talking about for short bursts, but on a long-term basis on a day-to-day basis, you probably want to be around six to seven clients most long-term. Now that doesn't mean you can't train more than, you know, like eight, nine or 10 here and there, but uh, I haven't known very many trainers that can train, you know, 40 sessions consistently 
week in and week out long term without experiencing uh, well, some type of burnout. I, I think a better yeah. tip is that because I do think that they're I think everybody when you first start, you should take everything you can. I think that's a, a sign of a, a, a good trainer. And I think you learn a lot uh, training at all hours and all types of people. But once you get to a place where you're you're making a comfortable enough income that you're you're not you know living paycheck to paycheck or stressed out how you're going to eat the next week, then I think it's really smart to start only taking the type of client that you like to train and being okay with okay I'm I'm going to turn down this client and I could make more money I have the availability to do it but quite frankly I know I don't enjoy doing that mm. but, and for me that was like I told I wasn't a big fan of advanced age and kids. It wasn't. Uh, it w- wasn't my expertise. I thought the training sessions were boring for me, um, and it wasn't that I couldn't or I wouldn't. It was that uh, they. I wasn't as uh, excited to train those types of clients, so I stopped taking them. You know, I I would look for my ideal client or the clients that I really enjoyed helping, and that makes a big difference on how that day feels like when you're training the type of client that you want versus taking clients just because you need the money and you're filling your your schedule up. I can do eight, nine hours uh, in a day of training clients if they're all clients I really enjoy. Uh, I could have only five or seven. If half of them I don't like, it will feel like oh, yeah. it'll, it'll feel like twice as long of a day. So I think that matters more than anything else. Yeah, it makes a big difference. And here, the, the other thing is this, is uh, as a trainer, you, you end up having to learn this because uh, if you don't, it's, it'll kill you. Don't take it personally when your clients don't do what you say. When you first become a trainer, you take it all personal. Like, I told her, you know, okay, oh, she's going to do exactly what I said. And then she comes back and you train her for months. Why aren't you doing the meal plan? Why aren't you following what I said? Why aren't you exercising on your own? And then you start to take it personal. And if you do that, you start to hate what you, what, what you do. What you end up having to realize at some point is this is a hard, long journey. Take nothing personal and just be happy that they're there making the the commitment to at least show up and work out with you and do the workout because otherwise you start to take things those, those things personal you start to have these battles with your clients you'll either lose clients or you'll get to the point where you start to hate people because they're just not doing any you start to feel like you have you provide no value i learned this the hard way by blowing people out the door for not following all my advice and then realizing that i've done them no good yeah. at all now do you did you guys ever have mm-hmm. a hard time with making time for yourself and did you have things that you did to like working out sometimes? Yeah. Yeah. That's part of the question, right? So it's yeah, not just carve that out. burn oh, sure. out for being a trainer. I scheduled but also, it. It was yeah. in my, it was in my schedule book. So I would all, if, if I had a gap that was an hour and a half or two hours, mm-hmm. uh, which I always made sure to have, I would write down workout. And so yeah. I for sure made a time. I think there also is, I mean, there's a, there's problems I see with, with your average trainer. That's kind of, and I know like you're just starting out. I totally agree with you guys. I think you should take on as many as possible. You're going to learn so much that way more than you would anywhere else. Uh, and then also you'll find like which ones, you know, you, you gel with the best and what direction to go with that. And then there's also charging more. And I, I feel like the, there's, there's a problem where trainers really undervalue a lot of what, you know, they provide, uh, their clients. And I think that they feel guilt. I think they feel a lot of guilt because a lot of the times what draws them into the fitness industry is their passion and their drive to help everybody. You know, we want to just help everybody. And I was, I had a little bit of that when I first started. I just want to help people, you know, and I would take people at, you know, reduced discount prices and, you know, these things just to try and keep making it work, you know, because I really cared about them, like getting to a place they wanted to go. Uh, so there, there was a part where I had to make a decision. Like, am I going to treat this like a business? Am I going to like, I actually have to make a living with this. I'm getting burned out because I'm just trying to cater to everybody else's demands. I need to start really focusing on what, you know, like fills me up. And then I can pour that into my clients more effectively. Once I started doing that, I actually got better clients as a result. And then also I was providing better service and I was getting paid more. So it was just like this, this like sort of aha thing that I went through. That's the, the irony I was going to say, you just pointed out is with that is you end up getting the clients that you have that are less of a headache, right? It's mm-hmm. always the clients that Yeah, the client that buys the three for 99. Yeah, that wants a deal or is a friend of a friend and they're getting hooked up or some bullshit. Those are always the ones that are less likely to wears on you. Yeah, follow what you're saying. And they're the ones that are the biggest headache. Shit, we see that even in this business. If we ever get a complaint or an email, it's always somebody who didn't buy anything. It's always, <laughs> it's, it's like, I was working with Ann the totally. other day and she's like reading me this, like, she, she, if we ever get any complaints, I want to see all of them just so we can continue to improve the business. And 
you know, she re reads me this person that's like complaining about something and we obviously have access to be able to look at all, you know, what, what they've read, what blogs. And this person has gone through like, you know, six blogs, three YouTube videos, downloaded two of our free guides, purchased nothing. But complaining, <laughs> saying, of course, it's that person. You know what I'm saying? The it's people true. that 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 get, that get things for free. It's funny yeah. how that that in the is. gym business is the people with the free passes. Like, right, they're going to complain the most mm -hmm. every single time. Right. The, the the last thing I'll add for from my end is uh, have fun, have fun with your training sessions, have fun with your clients. It, not only is it good for you, but it's also good for them. You'll find that when your clients enjoy coming to see you because you guys have a good time, you laugh, you joke around, you have fun with your workouts. It also makes it enjoyable for you. Um, when you're always serious with your sessions, like this is fitness, mm -hmm. we're working out, we're doing our sets, that's all we're doing. Oh my God, you do that day in and day out. <laughs> Watch how, how how tough it is to continue doing your job. Dude, that is such a good point. And you just reminded me of a tip that this person could use it. So, um, and I did it for this exact reason. Uh, it's totally selfish. Um, there wasn't a ton of value for them in their in their training program for this, but it was for entertainment for myself, and it doesn't hurt, right? Uh, I would compete my clients, like so. Uh, I start. I, I'd go through like a phase where it's planks, yeah. and so the end of every workout, we would do a plank hold for as long as they could, and I would time it, and then I would let them know where they ranked up against the rest of my clients, and so it made something fun that we could do, and it could be a, a squat hold, it could be you know, vertical jump. It could be a sprint on the treadmill for a mile. You could do a lot of different things that are fitness related that's challenging for them. And I used to end workouts that way. And they would love to see their improvement on that themselves and then also compare themselves to other clients. And then they gave me something kind of to have fun with. And that was a, I totally forgot all about that until you mentioned that. I think Very that's a great cool. point. Now make sure you head over to mindpumpfree.com so you can download all of our resources for free. We have books and guides on everything from getting a better squat to building more muscle in your arms to getting a flatter midsection. Again, it's mindpumpfree.com. You can also find the three of us on Instagram. You can find Justin at mindpumpjustin, me at mindpumpsal, and Adam at mindpumpadam.